I took Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and turned the difficulty up to extreme. This is my attempt to beat the game with insane rules like no catching, no money, no overleveling, no items in battle, no breeding, no legendary Pokemon, and set mode must be turned on. And hey, since most of my audience isn't subscribed, click subscribe or Charmander's tail will be extinguished. You're not a murderer, are you? Anyway, with these crazy restrictions, how far could I make it through the Sinnoh region? Well, here's how it went. After beating my rival, Cynthia, I head to the lake to pick my starter. Since I don't have to actually catch the starter, it's completely fair game for me to use. I pick Chimchar since it's the best option for this run, as I'll need something capable of soloing, at least until I can get some other Pokemon down the track. I reset a few times, until I got a Chimchar with decent stats and a reasonable nature. Welcome to the team, Mojo Jojo. You should catch more Pokemon. The more you have, the happier you'll be. Well, that explains a lot. The early routes pose little challenge, and I quickly make it to Ouroburg. After Chimchar evolved into Monferno at level 14, I was ready for the first gym. Rourke's rocks are pretty bulky, but Monferno knows Power Up Punch. It's not too strong, but with each use, my attack is raised by one stage. By chaining these together, Monferno can reach some Super Saiyan strength and sweep through the pet rocks that this gym has to offer. Didn't even break a sweat. That's my first badge. Back in Jubilife, and my god, the professor really needs some grooming. Fortunately, Christmas came early for Rowan with the sponsor of this video, Manscaped.com. The new performance package by Manscaped has got you covered literally from head to toe. The Lawnmower 4.0 is a cordless trimmer with a helpful LED light to make trimming a breeze. You've got the Crop Reserver and Crop Reviver to keep your cherubies feeling fresh, with the Weed Whacker that will make trimming your nose and ear hairs quick and trouble free. And to wrap it up, you'll also get the Shears 2.0 Stainless Steel Nail Kit. So, to add the Manscaped Performance Package to your Christmas list or as a gift for someone else, head to manscaped.com and be sure to use the code KEEGAN20 for 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts. Back to the video. After heading north of Jubilife, I reach Floroma Town where this couple will gift you the Pokemon Mew and Jirachi. But since I'm playing by the rule of no legendaries or mythicals, these are no go. Besides, where's the fun in stomping the region with legendaries? More importantly, how did you guys end up with these Pokemon anyway? At the Windworks, Commander Mars is no trouble for Monferno. A few power-up punches are the perfect setup to take Perugly down with a Muck Punch. The second gym would be a nightmare for the other two starters, and I doubt it would even be possible with Piplup. But for Monferno, it's a cakewalk, and this is the main reason that I picked it. Gardenia's first two grass types both fall to a flame wheel in quick succession. Roserade has a bit more fight in it, as it survives a turn, but doesn't have too much offense for Monferno, and I safely land a second flame wheel to give me the win. The early game in particular hasn't been too problematic to solo with my starter, but the game will very quickly catch up with me. As evidence of this, I came really close to losing against Commander Jupiter. My plan was to buff Monferno with Power-Up Punch against Zubat, however, I was confused by Supersonic, and hit myself in a big way since my attack boosts increase the damage. But with a little luck, I survived the confusion to take Zubat down. Skunk Tank is the real threat, but with my plus 5 attack, this lets me finish it off with one Flame Wheel, barely surviving its aftermath ability in the process. That was my first real close call of the run, and an early warning sign that I needed some new team members to help shoulder some of the weight. Fortunately, help is on the way. I've now got access to the Grand Underground, where I dig up mostly garbage, but eventually I find a Skull Fossil. The Ouroburg Museum can revive this into a Kranidos, which is added to my party without needing to catch it. Kranidos is a glass cannon in the truest sense. Its attack is through the roof, but the rest of its stats are very meh. In Heart Home City, this guy gives me an egg and I have to up my step count, but eventually the egg hatched into a Hapini. After giving it an Oval Stone, it quickly evolved into a Chansey, and then after more manic riding, Chansey's happiness was maxed and I could evolve it into a Blissey. Blissey is an absolute tank against special attackers, but very frail on the physical side. Regardless, I've got some big plans for Dr. Eggman here. Veilstone has some incredible TMs, if I could buy them. Must resist urge to shop. I can tackle the next two gyms in the order I choose, so I'm going to start with Wake and his water types. Wake has strong Pokemon, and neither Kranidos or Monferno are going to be much good in the water gym, so I guess it's all up to Blissey. But how can a defensive Pokemon like Blissey solo a gym? Well, with Cheese, of course. Gyarados's huge attack does not bode well for Blissey, so I first need to handle that. I taught Blissey the move Charm from the move relearner, and this lowers Gyarados's attack by two stages. While using a Citrus Berry and Life Dew to recover HP, this strat nerfs Gyarados' attack to minus 6 and it's much more manageable. 
The move Minimize brings my evasion to plus 6, so despite Blissey's balloon-like frame, it can now dodge attacks with ease. Now for the counter-attack. Blissey can also learn a move called Echoed Voice. It isn't very powerful, but it gets stronger with each successive use. With my stat buffs, there isn't much stopping me from charging up a few of these, with a third Echoed Voice spelling the end of Gyarados. Quagsire steps into the ring, but very quickly has its eardrums blown by Blissey's now booming voice. But at this point, I realized I'd made a huge mistake. See how close Blissey is to leveling? If it reaches level 31, I won't be able to use it for the next gym. So, I shifted my strategy and used Charm on Floatzel to nerf its attack. Then, I pivoted into my other team members, hoping to split the EXP into smaller segments, before switching back into Blissey. Blissey was able to remove Floatzel with no trouble, but it leveled up in the process despite my best efforts. I'd gotten my third gym badge, but would have to box Blissey for now. I charged back to Veilstone City to take on the next gym, but this was going to be tough. Kranidos would be useless against Maylene's fighting types, so this was going to have to be another solo effort, this time from Monferno. At this point, Monferno is a one-trick pony. Its only real strategy is to buff its attack with power-up punch, so that's the plan. To one-shot Lucario, Monferno will need to be at plus three attack. Against Metatite, I successfully land two hits, but get hit by Flash, which lowers my accuracy. Of course, I miss my next attack, and Metatite hits me with a big drain punch. I won't survive another, so take it down with a flame wheel. Then against Machoke, I miss yet another attack, and Monferno falls, with Kranidos going down soon after. My first wipe. Okay, I had some bad RNG there, so surely I'll be okay this time. Okay, third time's the charm. What the hell is this? Monferno gets hit by a single flash and just loses all motor function. I eventually landed my attacks, but wow, that was awfully unlucky. Anyway, that gives me my fourth badge, and with the new level cap, Blissey is back on the team. Shortly after, Kratos evolved into Rampados, and I was ready to press onwards to Celestic Town. No making boo-boos. Are you five years old? After doing Cynthia's dirty work and delivering a package to her mother, it's time to backtrack to Heart Home City for the next gym. Despite Fantina looking like a bratty child at a beauty pageant, her ghost Pokemon are no easy feat. I want to sweep with Rampados, but Fantina's Driftblim lead knows Will-O-Wisp, which does complicate things slightly. To get around this, I lead with Monferno. Just before Driftblim takes me down, I use Taunt, which will prevent Driftblim from using any status moves for a few turns. This clears Rampados to use two Swords Dancers and a Rock Polish. Once Taunt wears off, I am hit by Will-O-Wisp, but my Rost Berry heals the burn. Fantina's Pokemon are quite frail, so with this setup, Rampados goes to town, landing three Rock Tombs in a row for three very quick KOs. My team of three had made it this far, but battles from here were only going to get tougher, and I'd need more firepower if I was going to manage. Fortunately, after making it to Canaleve City, I was able to give my team a little upgrade. First of all, Monferno evolved into an Infernape. Second, by boating to Iron Island and completing the side quest, Riley gives me a Pokemon egg. Side note, Riley looks like a pimp. Should I be concerned about the origins of this egg? Anyway, I saved before Riley gave me the egg, as I was after some specific traits. I had to reset a few times, but eventually, I got a Riolu that would fit the bill. After biking some more with Riolu in my party, I was able to raise its happiness, evolving it into Lucario. Okay, I just have to say, why does it look like Lucario is having a mugshot taken? What crimes did you commit? Lucario is a crucial piece of my plan to take down Byron and his Steel types. I can't tell if his cape makes him look like a superhero or a hobo. His bronze or lead knows some annoying status moves like Confuse Ray and Trick Room, so my plan is to shut these down by using Taunt. A switch into Rampados lets me lay down Stealth Rock, the chip damage from which will nullify the sturdy ability on Byron's other two Pokemon. Bronzor does shake off the Taunt and manages to set up Trick Room before I can hit it with another one. I have to wait this out, so stall a few turns with Infernape before taunting Bronzor once more. Now a switch into Lucario is completely safe. I've given it the choice specs, and the plan from here is to take advantage of the low special defense on Byron's team. I fire off a string of Aura Spheres, eventually taking Bronzor down. The last two Pokemon on Byron's team each go down in one shot, and our new Lucario is already proving its worth. Six badges down. The Professor needs us to obtain the Lake Trio for research purposes. Hang on, doesn't that make us the same as Team Galactic? Are we the villains here too? This guy hit the fattest 360 no scope. What a gamer. Should we like help these magic harps? Eh, I'm sure they'll figure it out. Anyway, after stomping on Team Galactic for a laugh, I'm headed north to make sure that Cynthia is okay. Before that, I'll have to take on the easiest gym in all of Sinnoh. Candace's ice types don't have much going for them, so Infernape should be able to solo. 
A power-up punch on turn 1 finishes Snova while boosting my attack. Sneasel tries to raise its own stats, but Infernape can one-shot with another power-up punch even through its Choppleberry. Metacham does survive a hit, but it's a very familiar story as it goes down on the next turn. And finally, Abomasnow is 4 times weak to fire, so a single flame wheel melts it down very quickly. Told you she was easy. Cynthia is devastated since he donated his whole paycheck to Jupiter's livestream and she won't even show him so much as a toe. Classic Cynthia. This idiot drops the key to the Galactic HQ which, if you really think about it, sets off the chain of events that prevent Cyrus's plan. He's the real hero of the story. Cyrus gives me the Master Ball and says he doesn't need it. A short time later, Cyrus can't control Dialga and boy don't you feel silly. I can't even use this Master Ball, but I'm not giving it to you, idiot. Cyrus challenges me to a battle, but I've got a pretty solid strategy in mind. Blissey can use Charm to lower Honchko's attack, making it relatively safe to switch into Rampados. After two Swords Dances and a Rock Polish, I land an Earth-shattering Rock Tomb to take it down. With Cyrus's whole team being weak to Rock, Rampados is set to sweep in a very convincing fashion. Congratulations, your plan failed and you suck. I then face up to the Time God, and Lucario takes it down with two Aura Spheres. This is meant to be the climax of the story, but it turned out to be pretty easy. After strutting my way through to Sunny Shore City, the final gym awaits. Turn around, pal. You're not that guy. You don't want this beef. Ha, <laughs> pussy. Volkner's mixed bag of a team isn't that threatening. His Raichu pivots around with Volt Switch, but a Choice Specs Aura Sphere from Lucario can remove Ambipom and Octillery. Lucario won't survive another hit, so I switch into Blissey, who brushes off the Volt Switch like it was nothing. This brings Luxray out, and I begin nerfing its attack with Charm, while Softboiled restores my HP. With Luxray at minus 6 attack, Blissey is clear to fire off a string of echoed voices, which eventually finishes Luxray. Raichu struggles to overcome Blissey's bulk, and two supercharged echoed voices is enough to pick up the win. I'd now gotten all 8 badges under my insane rule set, and was feeling pretty confident. Maybe even too confident, but we'll get to that. Outsmarted once again. Oh man, I just can't figure it out. Victory Road doesn't give me much trouble, and I eventually make it to the Pokemon League. The fight against my rival was mostly smooth. The battles against him have been trouble-free throughout this run, and this time was no different, so I'll spare you the details. After a little bit of preparing, I was ready for the Elite Four. But this iteration of the Elite Four is on a whole new level. They've got perfect IVs, EVs, and natures, as well as updated movesets. This would no doubt be the biggest challenge of the run. Aaron is up first. For anyone playing along at home, this is prime Infernape country. The plan here is simple. Use Power Up Punch until Dustox lands a Toxic. This takes two turns, and Infernape's Petroberry heals this straight away. With plus two attack, Infernape can outspeed and remove Aaron's first four bug types by dishing out one Flame Wheel to each of them. Ironically, Aaron's Ace Drapion isn't a bug type, so I hit it with a close combat, picking up the KO. So far, so good. Bertha's ground types are much scarier, as three of my four Pokemon are weak to ground. This definitely won't be as smooth as Aaron, or so I thought. My plan was to set up Stealth Rock before letting Infernape go down. My Petroberry heals the first Toxic, and the second one misses. The third does land, but Infernape was able to raise its attack to plus three in the meantime with Power Up Punch. With these boosts, close combat absolutely rips through Quagsire and Whiskash. The broken affection mechanics then come in absolutely clutch. Infernape shakes off the poison and survives an earthquake from Golem when it definitely had zero right to do so. Another power up punch finishes Golem, with yet another taking Sudowoodo down. Hippowdon is beefy, but my stats are through the roof at this point, and one close combat gets the job done. The affection mechanics really gifted me that win. I didn't even need to use my actual plan. We take those, I guess. Against Flint, I use the same opening and set up Stealth Rock. Rapidash does put me to sleep, but my Chestoberry wakes me up. I then begin setting up Power Up Punches, but this is where I went wrong. I should have begun a setup with Rampados, and you'll see why. But at the time, my brain turned off, and I just took Rapidash down with Power Up Punch. Of course, Larpany fell very quickly before my boosted Infernape, and Steelix fell to a close combat. Driftblim goes down to a boosted Flame Wheel, and you might be thinking that things are going well. Wrong. Flint's Infernape is a monster. It has a plus speed nature, perfect speed IVs, and a stack of speed EVs. In short, it outspeeds everything on my team. My Infernape falls to a close combat, and everyone in the back is weak to fighting type moves. This is when I realized my mistake in not setting up with Rampados. As I prepared to watch my team members fall, I planned for another attempt. But then, Blissey dodged an attack before landing a charm. Reducing Infernape's attack let me survive a few more hits, landing two more charms. 
Blissey would ultimately fall, but with Infernape now nerfed, Rampardos is clear to Earthquake, sending Infernape 6 feet under. Flint is either about to go Super Saiyan, or needs the toilet, so uh, let's, let's leave him to that. Lucian has some strong Pokemon, but I intend to cheese my way through this fight. His Mr. Mime lead only knows two attacking moves, and both of these are special. Fortunately, I've got a special tank in the form of Blissey. First, I use Minimize three times to max my evasion, meaning that Lucian will struggle to hit me at all. Then, I begin charging up Echoed Voice, which gets more powerful with each use, eventually building up enough steam to remove Mr. Mime. I thought this was hilarious. Lucian's Metacham just took itself out by missing two high jump kicks. What an idiot. Anyway, the cheese keeps on giving, with Echoed Voice taking out Alakazam, as well as Girafferig. Last is Bronzong, but I have run into a problem. No more Echoed Voice PP. Since Blissey has no other damaging moves, I use Charm three times to nerf Bronzong, before switching into Infernape, who finishes the fight with a few flame wheels. Very clean. All that remained was Cynthia. Her team is insane, and there was no way I'd be able to overcome her in a straight shootout. If I wanted to claim the crown, I'd need a lot of luck and a lot of cheese. My first few attempts were awful. A combination of bad luck and poor planning had me holding multiple L's, and I started to question whether this was actually possible. But on this attempt, there was something different in the air. I need to remove Spiritomb quickly, since it can single-handedly ruin my plan. I do this by setting up Swords Dance with Rampardos, before tanking a Shadow Ball. With my stat buffs and the Soft Sand held item, one Earthquake from Rampardos takes care of Spiritomb. Rampardos has done its job, so after landing a big Earthquake onto Gastrodon, I let it go down with Scald. I send Infernape out next, and a close combat is able to finish the last of Gastrodon's HP. This baits Cynthia into sending out Milotic, which is exactly what I wanted. After Infernape falls, I send Blissey out. Since Milotic only knows special moves, Blissey can tank just about anything that Milotic can throw. I use this to my advantage, setting up three minimizers so Cynthia can barely hit me. From here, I use a new move on Blissey, Charge Beam. The damage is minimal, however it can raise my special attack stat, and that's my real objective. Milotic continues to recover, and a string of Charge Beams brings my special attack to plus four. It's now time to start building up Echoed Voice. In a strange twist, Cynthia switches into Lucario, but since it's a special attacker, Blissey is able to land two Echoed Voices for the KO. Roserade is next, but since my HP is low, I use Soft Boiled to return to full HP. After this, two Echoed Voices takes it down. Milotic then returns, but after Cynthia uses a full restore, it falls in just two turns. Garchomp was all that remained, but surely it wouldn't be able to hit me with Max Evasion. Blissey hung on out of sheer love, and one last echoed voice picks up the final KO. Congratulations, Keegan, so how's your Pokedex coming along? Um, well, the thing about that is, with that, I'd beaten Pokemon Brilliant Diamond with insane rules. 